Today we're going to talk about a very important topic. What happens when you die? And uh, are there any exceptions to this and, and that sort of thing? We're going to get some, try to get some clarity because uh, the world seems to be very, very, very confused about this topic. Um, you know, 1 Corinthians 14.33 says that God is not the author of confusion. Amen. Um, the Bible in, in Revelation 18 talks about Babylon. You have these, these fallen churches that teach um, various doctrines and everybody just kind of gets confused. In fact, the word Babylon comes from the Tower of Babel where God confounded the languages. He confused the languages. So a lot of people are confused. Revelation 18.4 says, God says, Come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon. Come out of that confusion. Don't be partakers of her plague. And so we don't want to be confused, amen? This topic we're going to talk about today is very important. What happens when someone dies and so forth? Because if you're confused on this topic, it could cost you your salvation. And the reason, the reason why it can cost you your salvation is because if you believe when your dead loved ones die, they immediately go to heaven then you can easily be deceived at the end when a demon comes and impersonates your dead loved one and deceives you with lies. Why wouldn't you be deceived? People are very gullible. People are already being deceived with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence now, you can't even tell the difference if someone's speaking or not unless you're in person. Because within three seconds now, it's down to three seconds, artificial intelligence can take your voice and mimic it. And continue talking when it's not you talking anymore. And make you say whatever you want to say. So you can't trust videos anymore. You're not even going to be able to trust your eyes and ears at the end of the, wor you know, the, end of the world here. You're only going to be able to trust in Jesus and the Word of God. Amen. So we need to know the Word of God. Amen. Can Satan transform himself into an angel of light? Where do we find that in the scripture? 2 Corinthians 11, right? What is it, verse 14? I want you guys to interact with me today, right? I want you guys to participate. Participate. Um, what happens generally when someone dies? What, what happens? They go to the grave. Do they know anything? How do we know they don't know anything? Ecclesiastes 9.5, which says, The living know that they should die, but the dead know not anything. What does verse 10 say? Whatever thy hand findest to do, do it with thy might. Right? For there is no wisdom nor device, nor or device nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest, right? And so you have in the grave you don't know anything. You don't know anything. What confuses people about this? Are there exceptions? Let's see. Jesus is the only way to heaven, right? But we get to heaven, the path that we get to heaven, meaning we're saved through Jesus, but we get there either by dying and being resurrected, or we're translated to heaven without seeing death. Is this true, yes or no? Are there any people in heaven right now? Yes. Who's in heaven? Okay, I heard Moses. I heard Elijah. I heard Enoch. Give me scripture. Give me scripture for this. How do we know Enoch's in heaven? Okay. 
Okay, so that's Genesis 5, 4. You said Hebrews 11, verse 5. Hebrews 11, 5. Hebrews 11, 5. So Enoch, it says in Hebrews 11, 5, was translated without seeing death. Somebody said Elijah. How do we know Elijah is in heaven? Second Kings. What chapter? Probably two. Verse what? Probably 11. It says that God took Elijah. Okay. But did God take him from here and put him over there? Like our Jehovah's Witness friends across the street believe? How do we know that? How do we know they're wrong? Well, there's, well, there's witnesses. But how do, give me scripture. The Mount of Transfiguration. Where do we find that? Give me the Word. Word of God. Matthew 17, right? Probably 3 and 4 and so forth. Talks about Elijah. Also mentions Moses there. So how do we know? Did Moses die? Yes or no? Am I going too fast? Just tell me to slow down if I'm going too fast. And I, I think... I for, forgive me if I uh, am not speaking very clearly today. I apparently brushed my teeth too hard and, and uh, have some gum issues going on. So, um, so Mount Tr- the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, Moses was there. Did Moses die, yes or no? Moses died, 120 years old, perfect health. God laid him to rest. God let him see the promised land from a distance, but didn't let him enter because he disobeyed, right? And God laid him to rest. How do we know Moses was resurrected? Give me scripture. Jude what? What verse? There's only one chapter in Jude. What verse is it? Verse 9. You guys like to sharpen your sword, yes or no? Iron sharpens iron. You guys like to sharpen your sword, yes or no? So Jude 9, what does it say? Who was disputing with the devil over the body of Moses? Michael. And what did Michael say? Moses, think about, think about this. When Moses had died and he was being resurrected, was he, was he resurrected before Jesus died on the cross? Before or after Jesus died on the cross? Before. How do we know that? Because he was at the Mount of Transfiguration before Jesus died on the cross. So, Satan is at the burial site of Moses. Michael comes and Satan's like, you can't take Moses. Jesus hasn't died on the cross. Michael says, the Lord rebuke you. And he's resurrected. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Right? No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus has the power of resurrection. Jesus was the Lamb of God slain from when? 31 A.D. or... Foundation of the world. The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. So at the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah are kind of giving Jesus a pep talk, aren't they? Moses represented the law, right? He also represented the people that would die and be resurrected to go to heaven. Elijah representing the prophets and he also represents the people that will be translated to heaven without seeing death. What is death, by the way? The first death. It's, it's a sleep. The Bible talks about it as a, a sleep. It's a dreamless, unconscious sleep. You know, you talk about Jesus says in John 11 that Lazarus was sleeping and his disciples said, well, if Lazarus sleeps, he'll do well because Lazarus was sick. And Jesus told him a few times that he finally said, Jesus says, listen, Lazarus is dead. Okay? I got to go wake him out of his sleep. And Jesus resurrected Lazarus. Did he say, Lazarus, come down from heaven? That would have been a dirty trick that Jesus played on his friend Lazarus, wouldn't it? What did he say? Lazarus what? Come forth. And what happened? Lazarus came forth, right? 
Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus has the power of the resurrection. And so we have to, we have to understand this. So let's see here. We got Enoch was in heaven. Elijah's in heaven. Moses is in heaven. Who else can we think of that, that is in heaven? Stacy's here today. Stacy says those who were resurrected when Jesus was resurrected. Where do we find that scripture? New Testament. Sally loves loves the broad answers. What Matthew twenty seven? What verse fifty two, fifty three? You see, Jesus was the first fruits, and the people that were resurrected as well on, on um, the Sunday there, or you know, when Jesus resurrected essentially, were also the first fruits. You see, Jesus died on Passover. He died on the first month of the year, the 14th day of the month. He died on Passover. Jesus laid in the ground over Sabbath. He rested even on the Sabbath, even in his death. Amazing. And that was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And on a Sunday morning, which was the 16th day of the first month, you can find this in Leviticus 23 if you don't know the yearly Sabbath, was first fruits. Jesus was resurrected. First fruits. You the the, the wave sheaf, you you would you would it's the first fruits of your your harvest. You see, Jesus is the resurrection, the resurrection and the life. You have to understand, He's got the power. When He resurrects, that means He has the power to resurrect us. When He resurrected Moses and He resurrected the people uh, there back in 31 AD, is showing that He is the first priest, that He has the power of the resurrection and the life. If the resurrection of Jesus never happened, then we have no hope. That's what the Bible says, and it's so true. We would be miserable. Why would we have hope? Right? Maybe I'll slow down just a bit. I'm just trying to make up, make up some time. Make up some time. Now, I want to just kind of generally talk about the chronology of what how things happen. Because timing is... is one reason why a lot of people will get, you know, mess things up and they're mistaken. You know, somebody, people on Facebook, it'd be somebody's birthday that passed away, and they'll say, I want to say happy birthday to so and so in heaven. And they're never in hellfire, by the way. Yeah. It's always in heaven. I want to say happy birthday. Listen, that's spiritualism. First of all, the Bible says that you don't talk to the dead. You know that? You don't talk to familiar spirits. That's spiritualism. That opens the door to Satan. Because you're not even talking to the dead loved ones. You're talking to a demon. You guys realize that? Spiritualism. And not only is it spiritualism, but it's, it's biblically inaccurate. And so if that dead loved one shows up in their bedroom one night and says, you know, Bobby, I appreciate you've been talking to me. I've been hearing everything that you said. I've been with Jesus, and Jesus says, ABC apostasy. And, um, you know, I, and you remember that time that um, we did this, it was just me and you. Just you and me, and nobody else was around, and we did this thing. You think Bobby's going to be deceived by that demon? Hook, line, and sinker. Hook, line, and sinker. You have to know what the Bible says. Ecclesiastes 9.5 says what? The living know that they should die, but the dead know what? If you went to heaven right upon death, would you be praising the Lord, yes or no? Yes or no? If you went to heaven upon death, immediately upon death, would you be praising the Lord, yes or no? 100%. What does Psalm 115 verse 17 say? The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. And so let me lay out some of this chronology because I think the timing is one of the things that people get confused. We've talked about some of the exceptions 
of the, Moses resurrected and Enoch and Elijah were translated. We have people resurrected. Uh, Jesus' resurrection. But generally speaking, what happens is when someone dies, they go to the grave. Now, death is the opposite of life. Genesis 2, 7. God is creating Adam there. He's got a body. Genesis 2, 7. Got a body laying there. It's Adam. Is Adam alive at that point? Yes or no? Does Adam have consciousness at that point? Yes or no? Does Adam have life at that point? Yes or no? Does he have love at that point? Yes or no? And what does it say? It says, And God formed man, Adam, out of the dust of the ground, and God breathed into his nostrils, what? The breath of life. That means the spirit, the breath of life. Spirit, breath of life, same thing, interchangeable. Breathes into his nostrils, the breath of life. And man became, what? A living soul. So is a soul something that we have or is a soul something that we are? A soul is something that we are. And so a soul is made up of two components. The body and the breath of life. The body and the spirit. You put them together, you have a living soul. You take them apart, you you, you have a, a, a body and a spirit. They're separated. You know, when you die, your spirit goes back to God who gave it. We're told in Ecclesiastes 12, 7. And, and that's, that's how it works. You die, your body goes to the grave. Your spirit, which is breath of life, goes back to God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Now, let's, let's just talk about the chronology. So, someone dies, that's what happens. Their body goes to the grave. Their spirit, the breath of life, goes back to God who gave it. Their thoughts cease to exist. They know nothing. They have no thoughts. Their love is gone. Their envy, their hatred, everything. The Bible says, put not your trust in princes or in the Son of Man in whom there is no help. When he dies, his thoughts perish. Okay? So, when someone dies, they they died three years ago, and let's just say they're saved. When do they live again? When Jesus comes the second time. So Jesus already came the first time, right? As a baby, as a man, Nazareth and so forth, right? But when Jesus comes again at the second coming, the resurrection takes place, doesn't it? What happens to the saved people that are alive and make it all the way to the end when Jesus comes? What happens to them? Yeah. Give me scripture. How do we know that? Okay, I heard First Thessalonians what? Four. Close. 15, 16, 17, 18. And what were you saying, Stacey? Oh, the one, uh, yeah, I think the same one. Yeah. Let's get the timing around. Let's go to First Corinthians. Let's go to First Corinthians 15. Before we go to First Corinthians 15, let's just go to 13. Because 13, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verses... Uh, but we're going to start in a few, few uh, verses before that. So, 1 Corinthians 15, and uh, let's see here, where we want to go. Where do we want to go? I think, let's go to verses 13, 14. So, we're in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 13, 14. And 20 and 22. It says, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? So is there a resurrection of the dead, yes or no? Because Christ is risen, we know there's a resurrection of the dead. Okay? Verse 14, And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead is the dead not rise up. So Paul's saying, if the, you don't have a resurrection of the saved, we're just liars. That's what he's saying, essentially. Verse 16, For if the dead rise not up, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. It's verse 17. Verse 18, then also 
then they also which are fallen in, uh, asleep in Christ are perished. That means fallen asleep means they, they died in Christ. They're perished. They have no hope. If Christ hasn't resurrected, they have no hope because they have no hope themselves of the resurrection. But we do have this hope, don't we? Because Christ has resurrected. And it goes on, it says, If in this life only we hope in Christ, we are all of men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead. Amen, Paul. And because the first fruits of them that slept. See, Christ is the first fruits, as well as those people that he resurrected and his resurrection. It says, verse 21, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So Christ is the first fruits. Now, in that context, let's skip toward the end of the chapter here. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 forward. Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means not everybody's going to die. He says, But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when, Paul, when does this happen? The chronology, the timing is important. If you watch a movie and you completely are watching it backwards and it's skipping around everything else, you're going to get confused. The same thing with the Bible. You have to understand the, the chronology, the timing. So it's very important. When, is, when does this happen? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. It happens at the last trump. Underscore that in your Bible. Underline at the last trump. Highlight at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible, that's our sinful body. Messed up gums and everything. Okay? For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal, humans are mortal. Humans are not immortal, immortal uh, inherently. The Bible says, 1 Timothy 6.16, that God only has immortality. Amen? But this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass this thing that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Amen? Now go with me. Let's figure out when this timing is. Let's figure out the timing here. Go with me. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4. And uh, this was the verse that Stacy was thinking of, I think. Right? Um. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And, and by the way, if you ever get confused, look at the Greek and study the Greek or study the Hebrew. You can do it. Let's start at verse 13. But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep. Again, he's talking about them that are dead. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. The Bible says, precious in the sight of God is the death of His saints. Did you guys know that? Precious in the sight of God is the death of His saints. Because to God, He's just going to resurrect them. It's not, it's not a big deal. Not a big deal. They're, they're, they're saved. They're, they, they can't be lost at that point. Okay? For if we believe that Jesus died and arose again, even so them which are asleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them from which are asleep. So Paul's saying, those of us that are alive and remain to the end of the world, we don't go to heaven before the dead do. We don't go before they do. And then he's going to go and explain it, explain it how exactly it happens. He says, for the Lord himself, who is the Lord? Jesus. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Jesus will descend from heaven with a shout. Jesus with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. There's that trump. There's that trump that we talked about at the last trump. Jesus is descending with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So if someone dies, they don't live again until Jesus, the second coming of Jesus at the resurrection. Those of us that make it all the way to the end of the world, we don't die. We're translated to heaven, so we get an incorruptible body, and we're translated to heaven. We meet, we meet Jesus in the air, and Jesus takes us to heaven. Okay? Jesus told us this in John 14. You remember what Jesus says? You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go there. Jesus says, I go to heaven to prepare a place for you. And if I go to heaven to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is coming back for us. Amen? Amen. He's coming back for us. He's coming back from the dead who have... The dead saved, and he's coming back for the the saved that are living. He's coming back for us. You know, um, there are two resurrections, two main resurrections, right? Resurrection of the righteous, resurrection of the wicked. Of course, there's a special resurrection of of the coming of Jesus, but we won't get into that. But there's two main resurrections, resurrection of the righteous and resurrection of the wicked. And so the resurrection of the righteous happens at the second coming of Jesus. Jesus takes us to heaven for a thousand years. And after the thousand years, we come down with New Jerusalem, down to earth. And there is a second resurrection, and it's the resurrection of the wicked, the resurrection of damnation. And this is where they face their judgment. The wicked are resurrected. They gather together for the the battle of Armageddon. They surround the city. They're going to attack. God's people, and God stops them. So just hold up right there. He shows them in a panoramic view the reason why they're lost. And they realize it, and they accept it, and that's when the saying, the, the verse that says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord comes to pass. They will say, Jesus is just, Jesus is fair, Jesus is the Lord, and we deserve this. And God unveils His glory, and the Bible says that God is a consuming fire. And God unveils His glory and destroys sin. And because they are clinging to sin, they will be destroyed with it. That's how it happens. John says, Jesus says, John 5, 28 and 29, marvel not at this. The time is coming when all that are in the grave should hear my voice. Those who have done good to the resurrection of, of righteousness and who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. The Bible says over and over and over. What questions do you guys have? I, I know this is, uh, we're doing more of a teaching instead of a sermon. You guys have some questions on this? Something that I need to, to make a little more clear? When did Paul, when, let me ask you, when did Paul expect to get his crown? When did Paul expect to go to heaven himself? Because, you know, when the scripture reading, the Second uh, Corinthians five, which people people use this verse right for false doctrine. Matter of fact, ho- go to Second Peter first. You know what was Peter's profession? What was Peter's profession? It was a fisherman. How I many of you guys know fishermen? You got you guys know any fishermen? Maybe some of your family members. Yeah. So fishermen. You know, you, you, you kind of get an idea what kind of person Paul, may, I mean, Peter may have been. But notice what Peter says about, about Paul in 2 Peter chapter 3. You know, a lot of times fishermen are just more simple people. They just, they kind of, they're fishing for a living. That's what they do. 2 Peter 3, notice what Peter says about Paul's writings. Starting at verse 15. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in his in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, that means twist, 
as they do all also the other scripture unto their own destruction. So should we be careful with, with twisting Paul's writings and the scripture? Amen, because it's going to be to our own destruction. So when in, in 2 Corinthians 5, the context here is the same context as 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 56 and so forth, of the end of the world at the second coming of Jesus. It's as simple as that. I don't have to go into it a whole lot. If you look at 2 Corinthians 4, 14, it says, Knowing that He which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. And so the context is the resurrection, amen? And we looked at when the resurrection takes place, which is at the second coming of Jesus. And when he gets into to chapter 5, he's talking about the earthly house, uh, this tabernacle will be dissolved. He's talking about his body. He's talking about our body. These bodies, these horrible, sinful bodies that we have all broken down and, and, and so forth, um, you know, they're going to be dissolved. These are just, a, these are just tabernacles. These, these are just tents. These aren't our permanent buildings. Our permanent buildings is our incorruptible bodies. This is what Paul is talking about. Will be dissolved. When does that happen? It happens at the second coming. And it says, and we, verse 2, for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, uh, that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. We don't want these sinful bodies getting sick and everything like that. Being burdened, not for that uh, we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up by life. When does that happen? At the second coming of Jesus, at the, at the resurrection, and, and so forth. Verse 5, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame, selfsame thing is God, for also he hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. What does that mean? What does that mean, that God has given us the earnest of the Spirit? we have any real estate brokers in the house? <laughs> I know we have one, Jennifer Beck, there's a real estate broker. What's earnest money? You put down on a house. That you're, that you're, you're guaranteeing that you're going to go through with the contract. That's earnest money, right? So what is the earnest of the Spirit then? Anybody know? Yeah, it's a down payment. Look, look at look at Ephesians. Hold your finger here where we are. Go to Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. For time's sake, I'll go right into it. In whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit. By the way, seal of God versus mark of the beast. How are we sealed? By the Holy Spirit. And what is sealed upon our foreheads? The law of God. How do we know that? What scripture? Isaiah 8.16 Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. But I get on a tangent and digress. Verse 14 says, Which is the earnest... So the end of verse 13 says, You're, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And then verse 14 says, Which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Now again, holding your finger in 2 Corinthians there, like you, you need, to, need to realize, uh, let's see, one second. Romans, Romans 8.11 says this. This is the earnest of the Spirit, right? Romans 8.11. But the Spirit, that is a capital S, <clears throat> but the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. And so all Paul's saying here in 2 Corinthians 5 when he says the earnest of the spirit, he's saying the Holy Spirit, the spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead, you know he's going to raise you up because he gave earnest money when he raised up Jesus. Because Jesus was resurrected, you're guaranteed to be resurrected. If you trust in Jesus. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
That's what Paul's saying. That's what Paul's saying. Verse 6, back in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are home in the body, that is, broken in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. But we confident, I say, and willing rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. All Paul is saying here is, we groan for the second coming of Jesus. We groan to have immortal bodies at the second coming of Jesus. We groan for the resurrection so we can see Wilbur again. Do we not groan for the resurrection? Do we not groan for having new bodies? That's all it's saying. And so when you run into these kind of tough scriptures, so to say, you need to understand, you need to ask yourself, when does this happen? When does this take place? And, uh, and go from there. But I could give verse after verse after verse and, 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 and keep going because, um, you know, it, it's limitless. I will end here. When did Paul expect to get his crown of glory? Paul wrote these hard verses that people get confused by, you know, difficult verses as people think. But when did Paul, last verse here, last verses here, Expect to get his crown. Anybody know? When Jesus comes, give me scripture. Let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verses. Um, we're going to go... Um, 6, 7, and 8 here. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6, 7, and 8. This is as we're closing. When did Paul himself that wrote all of these things that churches out in the world, different people twist to their own destruction, when did Paul expect to get his crown of glory and his reward? 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me. When, Paul? When is he going to give it to you? At that day, and not to me only. Paul's saying, he's not just going to give me the, uh, my righteous crown, but he's also going to give it, it says, unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul is expecting to get the crown at the appearing at the second coming of Jesus. Amen? With everybody else. So, don't be afraid of the truth. Search it out. And, you know, just, just the truth... Jesus says, John 8, 32, you should know the truth and the truth will make you free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for giving us your word today. We thank you for rightly dividing the word of truth in our minds. God, we ask you to give us your Holy Spirit double portion so that we may have a burning desire to study your word and, and get a better understanding of you and, and what you want us to do and, and, and to take the the gospel to a dying world. God, we uh, we pray that you be with us now. Keep us safe as we go home and so forth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.